Okay, hi guys. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so we waited five minutes for everyone in the audience to join. So I guess we can start now. Um, Dr. Alberti, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'll be um, transferring control over to you now and you can start sharing your PowerPoint. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be with you today. I will address the topic I'm an expert about, which is chemotherapy-induced peripheral neurotoxicity. First, we will have a look at the clinical picture of this condition, which is troublesome in cancer survivors. And we will try to understand why we do not have a cure for it so far, and what could be done to build a clinical trial in order to potentially so this medical condition, and last but not least, since so far no drug is really promising to cure CIPN, maybe we should go back to the bench side. So preclinical research aiming at assisting uh, the clinician in uh, managing the patients. First of all, what is chemotherapy-induced peripheral neurotoxicity? Of course, it affects cancer patient, and it is an emerging problem. When we use this acronym, CIPN, we refer to this specific condition that is caused by chemotherapy administration. It is true that the peripheral nervous system, therefore a neuropathy, can ensue for many other reasons in a cancer patient, for example, uh, cancer-related neuropathies due to paraneoplastic syndromes or radiation-induced neuropathies. But so far, CIPN is the most represented, speaking of incidence and in prevalence in cancer survivors. The clinical picture is quite um, constant among different patients. The sensory system is the one that is affected the most. The distribution of signs and symptoms is stocking and globe-like, so hands and feet are affected more and the most. Um, the temporal progression is very slow, usually, so it is not an acute uh, condition, apart from one syndrome I will relate about in a few minutes. And usually um, it's progressive also in the anatomical distribution. It starts from the tips of fingers and toes, and then over weeks, it can spread going towards the center of the body. All sensory modalities can be affected, both large and small fibers. And we see that means quite a different clinical picture in your patient. Moreover, neuropathic pain can be present. Neuropathic pain, as you well know, is not a general pain, a pain due to inflammation. Uh, it's a specific pain due to nerve damage, which is quite tricky and troublesome, difficult to be treated with drugs. The features are of cold pain, electric shocks in the limbs, so very painful, more than just the regular pain you might feel when you have an headache. Another interesting feature of CIPN is that there's some time you observe a phenomenon which is called a costing phenomenon. What does it mean? It means that even if you stop chemotherapy, since the drug is still, let's say, in the system of the patient, the worsening of the symptoms and signs can be seen even in the months after chemotherapy suspension. That's it's said to be uh, easy for you to understand that even if the patient develop symptoms after chemotherapy, it still can be that condition and not something else. This particular condition is what we call time and dose dependent. It means that you need to give your patient a few chemotherapy cycle to reach the true neurotoxic dose. Therefore, it gets at least a couple of months to see the effects on your patient. Sensory manifestation are the most important ones, as I've already said. Usually motor impairment is not that pronounced. If motor impairment paralysis is very important, think about something else like Guillain-Barré syndrome, because it's not the key feature of CIPN. Of course, 
in a neuropathy, if you test deep tendon reflexes, they will be diminished or even absent. However, there is one drug which is the trickiest of them all. CIPN is related in general to the main, mainly used chemotherapy drugs, platinum drugs, vaccines, bilkai colloids, proteasome inhibitors. Therefore, drugs that you can use to treat colorectal cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, and even hematological malignancies. Oxaliplatin, which is one of the platinum drugs, is very peculiar from the neurotoxicity point of view. In fact, apart from the chronic situation I have described a few minutes ago, here you actually have an acute neurotoxicity pattern. Acute means that symptoms can arise as soon as the patient receives the first cycle, and they are present usually in the first 24, 72 hours after the IV administration of the drug. Sign and symptoms are quite tricky. They are similar to what you would see in a patient affected by a genetic channelopathy. Uh, these are cold induced paresthesia. For an example, the patient puts the hand in the fridge and tingling paresthesia are there. The patient drinks something which is quite cold or eats something that is quite cold and the area, the throat, feels this tingling sensation, stabbing, quite unpleasant. The typical feature is that this is not a constant condition. It goes on and off and it is induced by the cold trigger. We'll see later on how this can help us in a bench to bedside approach to find a potential uh, novel treatment for this condition. Let's put this in our mind and we will go back to this later on. I've said that CIPN is related to many different chemotherapy drugs. In this table, you see all the drugs I have already enlisted. Platinum drugs, being alkaloids, taxanes, botetomib, even thalidomide. The truth is that the clinical picture is a little bit different uh, considering the different drug class. Of course, different drug classes have different mechanisms to kill cancer cells. The same goes for their neurotoxicity profile. The exact mechanism of damage of these drugs, speaking of what they do on your neurons, is not completely established. But um, evidence so far are saying to us that different drug class can alter neurons with different mechanism. And they have, let's say, a um, kind of tropism for some of the fibers. Let's make some examples. For example, platinum drugs, carboplatin, cisplatin, xaliplatin, are quite peculiar because they usually damage more the large sensory fiber than the small ones. What does it mean? That your patient is more likely to lose proprioception and develop sensory ataxia. And in a few moments, I will explain a bit better what sensory ataxia means. Instead, Drugs like bortezomib, used to treat multiple myeloma, is more likely to damage small fiber of your peripheral nerves, which is the result, you have more neuropathic pain than sensory loss. So if you are, let's say, an expert of this condition, you might recognize by the clinical picture of your patient, which is the drug that was given to this person specifically. But let's focus on the two big issues that we have here and we should somehow deal with to ameliorate the quality of life of our patient. On one side, we have neuropathic pain and on the other side, we have sensory ataxia. Neuropathic pain, as I've already said, is a very specific pain. The area involved um, is characterized by very unpleasant feeling of painful cold, to make a comparison that might be somehow understandable to you, think of yourself. Uh, 5 a.m. in the morning, you are going to reach your car, you have to go to the hospital, to the university very early, your car was in the street all the night, uh, temperature was below zero, 
So you touch uh, your car and you feel a cold and painful sensation. That's what your patient feels each day, every day. Not particularly pleasant. The other kind of sensation that are typical of neuropathic pain is a burning sensation and even a little bit of itching. It's important that you get this is the pain of your patient because this kind of pain doesn't um, benefit at all from standard pain treatments. For example, ibuprofen and similar. You need specific drugs we prescribe as neurologists or in general as healthcare professionals, which are usually uh, drugs being part of classes like antidepressant and anti-epileptic drugs. So drugs that should be quite carefully given to your patient, finding the correct dose. And another problem you have is that if you have an headache, you can take your ibuprofen one hour and you probably will resolve your problem. Instead, drugs for neuropathic pain to reach the target, modulate, decrease the pain, they need even a month. So it's a very tricky condition to be managed. And that's the first part of the story. Let's say the positive symptoms, things that our patient have and they shouldn't have. Let's go on the other side of our coin, the negative symptoms. Our patients aren't able to feel anymore quite well in their hands and feet. This can be something very, very troublesome. If you do not feel quite well where your limb is positioned, you are not able to walk, to walk steadily. You can fall, and this is not okay. Let's think in a real life situation. You have breast cancer, you have a metastasis in your femur, you get chemotherapy, you develop sensory ataxia, which means you do not feel well your, where your limb are positioned. You are walking, you fall, and you break your femur. As a, it has a metastasis, so it's uh, more likely that this happens. But uh, the decreased feeling is also present in your hands, which might be the consequence. If I do not feel well, in particular at the tip of my fingers, I'm not able to manipulate well small objects, for example, and very common tasks, they become just simply unbearable for our patient. They can't do simple things like buttoning a shirt. And this can have also an effect on their daily life activities. For example, let's think about um, a surgeon. If one day the surgeon isn't able to feel anymore quite well what he or she has in her on his hands, which is the effect, that probably that surgeon is not that skillful enough to carry on with a medical operation. Just to give you an understanding of how much this condition can have an impact on your patient cancer survivors. At this point, you might ask me, okay, the patient develops this condition, which is the treatment, which are the options. And luckily, we do not have many options. In the slide, it is shown a very refined meta-analysis performed by the American Society for uh, Clinical Oncologists, and they took care of revising all the clinical trials, and they concluded that, unfortunately, so far, nothing works to prevent CIPN. There is just minor evidence that you might use duloxetine, an antidepressant, able to inhibit the reuptake of serotonin and noradrenaline. They, might, they said that duloxetine might benefit a little bit the symptoms of your patient. Actually, this is no surprise because duloxetine can be used in general to treat neuropathic pain. But we are not speaking of a general situation of a general population. We are speaking of a specific population cancer survivors. Sometimes duloxetine might not be the best option you might select. Why is that? Because your cancer patient, in particular breast cancer patient, for example, might be undergoing treatments even after standard chemotherapy that causes CIPN. An example, tamoxifen. From a pharmacokinetic point of view, 
tamoxifen, tamoxifen and duloxetin don't, don't work well together. So the only one option you have in literature might not have a complete application in a real life situation. Therefore, we need a lot of research in this field to fill this unmet clinical need. But now you might ask me another question. Okay, you said that you have positive symptoms, but you also said that patients uh, don't feel well in their limbs and they are somehow clumsy. Why do not, why you don't apply physiotherapy, for example? That might be something that you can do. So far, uh, no clinical trial demonstrated very well and with a robust outcome measure that this option is appropriate. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying that unfortunately, clinical trials were not designed so well that now we can say this specific treatment is the one you should be using in your patient. In a few slides, I will go into more details why clinical trials in CIPN might, uh, might have some problems, methodological ones. But before going into this discussion, let's focus on another relevant aspect. You might ask me, okay, you are saying that cancer patient, they get chemotherapy, they develop CIPN, they survive cancer, but if they survive cancer, you can wait until the neuropathy just goes away. Actually, data on long surviving cancer patients are showing us that a relevant proportion of them doesn't have a complete recovery from CIPN. These are data from a population we follow up up to two years after chemotherapy. Other people studied the same, so many other authors tried to understand if CIPN was persistent after chemotherapy, even after eight, 10 years, and the answer was yes. Of course, not 100% of the patient, but a good proportion was still suffering from this condition as this slide are trying to summarize. So we have a condition that is relevant, that has no treatment and can be persistent. Now we need a clinical trial to decide that our drug XY is working for CIPN. We have a problem with outcome measures. Outcome measures are the instruments that we use in a clinical trial to decide if the drug we are giving is able to prevent or to cure the condition which is the objective of the trial. When we are speaking of CIPN, unfortunately, we do not have a gold standard to say there you have CIPN and you have this severity in the disease. So let's say we don't have a blood test you run and you know, okay, CIPN is there and you have this kind of severity. The same goes for other possible approaches like diagnostic exams of past lab tests and clinical evaluation. Actually, in the last 10 years, many eminent investigators, in particular from the Peripheral Nerve Society, have addressed this issue. They have performed clinimetic studies, and probably we are finally reaching the point in which we have solid and robust outcome measure to run our clinical trial. What the experts are saying right now is that you need a multimodal assessment, which means evaluating the patient and have the patient answer some questionnaires, for example, and on top of that, you might add some instrumental testing. Let's go into deeper detail. We have many dom dominions that should be tested, sensory, motor, autonomic, deep tendon reflexes, and composite function, which is talking about sensory ataxia. Why is that? Because these are the possible consequences you have due to CIPN, even if sensory ones are, of course, the commonest. 
in the oncology world, because we are speaking about oncology patients. So the oncologist is the first medical professional who is dealing with the patient. They use in clinical trial, very uh, rough uh, scales to say, okay, you have CIPN there and it is as severe as that. If you look at this slide, in fact, they just say, okay, they have something, something even more, but it is not a refined instrument. And we demonstrated in a, a precise study that this scale might not be the most appropriate one, in particular because no neurological evaluation is part of that assessment. That's why the CI Perinoms group um, performed a very extensive study testing for many different physician rated and patient reported outcome measure to decide if the evaluation was consistent using one instrument or the other. Long story short, they showed that a very trained investigator with some of the instruments they used were okay. I will go into details of these instruments in a couple of slides. In general, in this specific setting, as I've already said, you have two different sides of the same coin to be looked at. On one side, the opinion of the patient on the condition that the patient himself or herself is experiencing. And on the other side, the clinical judgment of the physician, of the person in charge of the medical assessment on how much the condition is severe or not. But the situation is a little bit tricky once again. First of all, there is no perfect consensus between the patient and the physician when assessing the same patient. Why is that? Of course, if I am the person experiencing the pain, depending on my situation, I might interpret the same thing differently from the physician because I'm the one who is feeling, who's living with this pain. I might tolerate it with well than another person might. Moreover, there is another possible confounding factor. Some patient, it was demonstrated with uh, some studies sometimes underreport their symptoms related to CIPN because they fear to receive less chemotherapy and then to not get the cure for cancer. Moreover, even clinician might be wrong, not only just because they might rate CIPN differently from what the patient does, but also because sometimes you might misinterpret signs and symptoms. Previously, I said that when a CIPN patient doesn't feel well in hands, he or she is not able to manipulate well to button a shirt. We run a survey among oncologists and we ask them, okay, if you have one of your patients coming back to your um, evaluation saying that um, now, he or she is not able to button well the shirt. What do you think? It's a motor problem, so strength diminishing there, or do you think it's a sensory problem, no feeling there? The answer was they thought it was a motor problem. So it's very important that the investigator in charge of evaluating a CIPN patient is very well trained and has a very precise notion of what CIPN is and what CIPN isn't. Over the years, moreover, as I already said, also instrumental approaches were evaluated by eminent investigator and I rated them via a revision of literature. In particular, now I would like to point out the importance, eventually in a clinical trial, of neurophysiological testing. Of course, we are speaking of peripheral neuropathy, so the most simple, simple exam you might run is a nerve conduction studies and EMG, the classical one when you do suspect neuropathy is there. Neurophysiology might be very handful because um, CIPN is length dependent. This definition um, is matching what I said before. Symptoms start at the most distal portion and they 
eventually go back, reaching the center of the body. Therefore, you can test very distal nerves to get earlier the diagnosis of this condition. Once again, uh, CIPN is mostly sensory, therefore it's very important to test the most distal branches of the peripheral nervous system, speaking of sensory nerves. We are quite lucky because as it is shown in the picture, you can test a nerve uh, in the lower limbs, which is called a dorsosural nerve, which can give you a very earlier detection of CIPN. In a study performed on colorectal cancer patient uh, administered with oxaliplatin, we actually demonstrated that if you run a monitoring of the dorsal sural nerve air conduction study before and at mid-treatment, you are able to predict if the patient is developing neuropathy at the end of treatment and how intense, how severe this neuropathy will be. So it, it, it's a powerful tool. This is of course a preliminary study on a specific population, but it shows the promising role of neurophysiology in the prediction of neuropathy early during the treatment. Let's put a pin here because later on, we will learn how this particular technique, neurophysiology is relevant when you want to go back to bench side. In the last few years, finally, we reached a turning point in the clinical assessment in clinical trial. A couple of years ago, we published this paper on neurology, and we demonstrated that a very brief neurological evaluation formalized via a, a scale, top of neuropathy score. Long story short, you perform a very brief neurological examination and you rate, you just fill the table, put some numbers, you get a score and you can say, yes, there is CIPN there and it is that severe or mild. Moreover, we demonstrated in a longitudinal monitoring that we have um, some indicators that are relevant. We calculated the number, which is called minimally clinically important difference. So I know that if a patient starts with this number and then the score increases of a couple of points, this is clinically relevant. My patient is having a real, true neuropathy worsening. I know that might sound simple and boring, but it's very important when you are running a clinical trial and in perspective, you would have an indicator saying this is a patient that is at higher risk to get a neuropathy that doesn't resolve even years after chemotherapy. This is the scale. It's a very simple table. You just test a few things that you would do quite normally in a clinical evaluation from a neurological point of view. Moreover, we also demonstrated that you can go for an even more reduced, a reduced version of this scale, which doesn't require even strength assessment. So this kind of assessment requires just yourself your ability to interact with the patient because you have to ask a few questions about uh, the symptoms. Then you need a neurological hammer to test reflexes, very easy. You can choose whatever model of neurological hammer you would like. And then you need a tuning fork. This is a very, very relevant instrument. Why is that? Because this instrument enables you to evaluate large fibers the ones that are related to sensory ataxia, that impairment that make your makes your patient clumsy, the gait is unsteady, the manipulation is altered. Let's see how it works. I will start the video. You can have this thing vibrate. If you look carefully, now a little triangle is appearing as the instrument is slowing down the vibration. Basically, you put the instrument vibrating as the doctor is doing right now on some bony protuberances and ask the patient, please tell me when you feel that the instrument is not vibrating anymore. Of course, there are normative data which should be corrected for age classes. So I put here my instrument my patient is 20 years old. 
I expect for lower limbs that this is the value I should get. So the patient should be able to feel the vibration respecting the threshold shown in the table. I assure you, it takes just one minute to be performed and is a perfect indication of sensory ataxia being there or not. And anyone can be trained to perform this kind of evaluation, a research nurse, a physiotherapist, and every medical doctor, not just neurologist, the oncologist, the specialist, you whatever want. Moreover, in the same study I've shown you before, we reached another goal. As I said uh, in uh, one of the previous uh, slides, we do need the opinion of the patient. We um, evaluated the FACT-GOG neurotoxicity subscale, a very short questionnaire that you can use to see if neuro neuropathy is doing something to your cancer patient. And we demonstrated that among the 11 original items, you can even reduce further uh, the scale to less items that are the one clinically relevant. You might be bored by my, my talking, but I assure you that for patients, if you decrease even more um, the questions they should feel by themselves, it's better because they are fatigued. So the less you do, the more consistent you do this small amount of evaluation, the best data you can have. It's better to have less that is robust than 1,000 data that you are not so sure about and might be in the evening, in the end, quite unuseless. But we are missing something. So far, we have rated, uh, let's say, sensory impairment mostly. The scale, the total neuropathy score, doesn't rate pain. This is something you should do. It's very simple. My suggestion is to do what is shown in this slide. First of all, as I've already said a few times, you have to be sure which is the pain you are dealing with. Of course, cancer patients might have pain due to other reasons. They might have bone metastasis or a general inflammation or whatever. This questionnaire, developed by a French group led by Boissira, is a very good one. You have just 10 items and you have a specificity and a sensitivity higher than 90% to get a real neuropathic pain if the score of the questionnaire is four or higher over a total amount of 10. So you first run the questionnaire, you say, okay, it's neuropathic pain, it's the true one. The one that would require duloxetine or some other medication, not just ibuprofen or ketoprofen or whatever you use for inflammation or inflammatory pain. But then you can also match this information with a scoring system for the pain. The PNRS is a good one. So a scale that goes from zero, no pain, to 10, the worst possible pain your patient can think about, the patient gives the rating and let's say that is clinically relevant above three and from seven to 10, you are required to do something now because the pain is really intense. In the opinion of your patient, because you can't rate the pain on the BL for your patient, at least so far you can't. So you have to ask, but we are in the era of biomarkers. Is there a biomarker that you can use? At the state of the art, you can't go in your hospital and check for one lab test or for an instrumental testing and have for sure a reply about CIPN. But in the future, probably we will have something like that. You might have heard about neurofilament light chain that gained a lot of interest in the neurology world because they are part of the axons and they are released even in bloodstream, not just in the cerebral spinal fluid, and they can be assessed. So I have a damage of the nervous tissue. I run the lab test. I expect this value to be increased. We first demonstrated that this happens in CIPN relying on rodent models. So first we tested the hypothesis at the bench side. Then we did the same in a real life population, a breast cancer patient, and we demonstrated that in fact, 
from baseline before chemotherapy and after chemotherapy, as well as during chemotherapy, the levels of neurofilament line change were increasing, giving us a clue about CIPN development. So it's not a gold standard right now, it might be in the future. Research is ongoing in this specific field, which might be the next step. Since we still have a few pitfalls, let's say in the clinical assessment and in, on how to build a strong clinical trial, we are running right now uh, a study, an international one to do that. If you want, you can check it on clinicaltrials.gov. We are still accepting country sites to be on board. The study is, let's say, a two-layer study. First level, core study, very tiny amount of outcome measure to be applied, extended study, many more outcome measure. We expect that 30 countries all around the world uh, will be recruiting in the next few months. And in a couple of years, we will have strong, robust data describing the natural history of the CIPN and probably giving us a final answer on the best way to assess it, in particular, uh, if you want to run a stronger, robust clinical trial. That's the first part of the story. We need to ameliorate how we run the clinical research. But to run a clinical research, I need a molecule, a drug to be tested. How do I decide a drug is okay to start a phase two, phase one clinical trial? I start from the bench side. So nowadays, research needs to be translational. Basic researcher and clinical researcher should cooperate together. That's what we do in our center. What you can do to bring together two settings that are so different, animal models on one side and patient on the other side, you can exploit the technique I gave you insights a couple of minutes ago, neurophysiology. CIPN is a sensory, land-dependent, axonal neuropathy. If you use neurophysiology, you expect that your, your amplitude in your nerve, the sensory one, is diminished. But luckily, the same technique can be performed in preclinical models. Same instruments, different setting, same results. Moreover, now I would like to go in details uh, for what regards that tricky acute neurotoxicity syndrome I described for oxaliplatin. I said to you that my patient that are, who are receiving oxaliplatin uh, resemble patient affected by genetic channelopathy. Of course, they do not develop a genetic condition uh, abruptly. But the drug oxaliplatin is able to interact with voltage-operated ion channels, altering their kinetics. So transient phenomenon, a couple of days, they show similar condition to the genetic patients. This was demonstrated directly and indirectly by many different research groups. And we also um, observed data that were consistent with this hypothesis. But if you want to demonstrate this for sure, once again, you might exploit neurophysiology. Nerve conduction study, the classical exam you can perform is not enough. But with a specific hardware and software developed by Professor Hugh Bostock, UCL London, you can stimulate the nerve many, many times, and you can get some curves that can tell you about this situation, the axon, the ion channels, and how is the excitability, which is the plus of this technique that once again, you can perform it in humans as well as the preclinical model. So you have a decoy, an instrument you can use at both sides to try to find an answer to this specific condition, how to cure CIPN. The future might be that bedside research will ameliorate how they run the clinical trial. Bench side research will provide 
uh, inside some molecules to be tested. Then they meet together in the middle. And finally, new drugs to be tested for CIPN can be um, exploited. Now, in the last few minutes of my presentation, I would like to give you a true life example. Let's go back to Xaliplatin once again. As you might understand, I work on this drug quite a lot. The balloon you see nearby the guy in the uh, slide is what my patient might tell me after they get the first oxaliplatin infusion and they do say the same thing after every infusion. So all are the symptoms uh, they have due to the transient channelopathy. I was um, quite surprised that the first time I evaluated patients like that. And I was uh, trying to ask myself, why is that? Why is that? Nerve excitability testing gave some kind of answer. Um, I'm not showing the data from previous uh, literature research, but long story short, applying this technique and other techniques in an in vitro setting, the answer was that probably sodium voltage operated ion channels were altered. So I went back to the bench side and we used nerve excitability testing to demonstrate that oxaliplatin was in fact causing this transient channelopathy in the rodent model. But given that sodium voltage operated ion channels can be very well modulated by antipileptic drugs, we decided to use topiramate to say if we were able to revert this acute hyperexcitability syndrome. Oxaliplatin is the red curve. Control animals are the green curve. Topiramate plus oxaliplatin is the blue curve. Long story short, if you give oxaliplatin and topiramate, which means you give the animal each day, every day, even Saturdays and Sundays, peros, the drug, you prevent the acute effects of oxaliplatin. We were very lucky because we prevented the acute phenomenon, but we also prevented the neuropathy. After a couple of months of treatment, control animals have very beautiful nerves when you perform the biopsy. Oxaliplatin animals instead have a decrease of fibers. These are the curves showing the distribution of the fibers. The smallest one is oxaliplatin. This one is the control, but let's have a look at the combination group, oxaliplatin plus topiramate. They are not that much dissimilar respect to the control group. So we obtained a very good level of neuroprotection. At this point, we tried to understand why, because it exceeded our expectation. How a transient dysfunction of the sodium voltage operated ion channel might become an actual axonal damage? This might be the answer, the sodium calcium exchanger. Let's say that neurons are perennial cells. So you are born with these neurons, and if you're lucky, you have them for the whole duration of your life. They do not replicate. So they do need a very well-balanced homeostasis. How they do that? Controlling in particular ions because they are excitable cells. So they have rise and fall of a concentration of the ions inside, sodium and potassium in particular, as you well know. So what does the sodium calcium exchanger do? Let's have a look at this part of the image. Normal situation, the transporter works in the forward mode. It takes sodium inside the cell and it pushes calcium away from the cell. But what happens when you have a condition that increases the amount of sodium you add inside there? There is a change in the mode. The reverse mode is there. So in this case, sodium is pushed out from the cell and calcium is taken in. Unfortunately, neurons don't like to have too much calcium inside of them because a too pronounced increase of calcium can activate some caspases and many pathways that lead to axonal damage and even to neuronal death. So that was my hypothesis. 
topiramate probably worked because preventing sodium imbalance, I prevented that NCX2, the sodium calcium exchanger, went crazy. To demonstrate or to at least check if my hypothesis was correct, we performed a combined in vitro and in vivo study. And we published last summer the results. Let's start from the cells. These are neurons that are there in culture and are exposed to oxaliplatin. And oxaliplatin plus a drug able to block the effect of the sodium calcium exchanger. So oxaliplatin, this is the control. The neuron is here, is very happy, and the neurites grow beautifully like a crown. You give oxaliplatin, the crown is less visible. If you give the inhibitor, statistical significance is reached for the arborization to be more similar to the control than to oxaliplatin. Then we also went in vivo to get preliminary um, evidence. Long story short, with nerve excitability testing, we demonstrated once again that the cores were, were compatible to an impairment in sodium voltage operated ion channels. After a couple of months of treatment with chemotherapy, oxaliplatin, all the outcome measure I can use, neuropathology, behavioral tests, and neurophysiology were saying to me, okay, your animals treated with oxaliplatin and neuropathy. We tested biological specimen, in particular dorsal root ganglia, and we saw that the levels of NCX2, the sodium calcium exchanger, were different from the control group, saying to us that probably this transporter was involved in axonal damage. This is preliminary data. In general, the hypothesis is that actually this mechanism might be in place even in other neuropathy. So you have an upstream and a downstream event. Up here, you have an impairment of the sodium axis. Down there, you have an impairment of the sodium calcium exchanger. End of the story, too much calcium inside the neuron, the neuron is damaged. I convinced the Cariplo Foundation that my idea was a good one. And a couple of months ago, I was funded 250,000 neurons to run a three-year preclinical project to verify if my hypothesis is correct. We will run both in vitro and vivo testing, and we will modulate the sodium calcium exchanger with a um, quite relevant novel technology, which is the small interference RNA. If we are very lucky and we work very well, why not? In three years, we might have sufficient data to go back to the bench side, sorry, to the bed side, to run a phase one clinical trial. If I've not bored you to that, and you are a bit curious about peripheral neuropathies, peripheral nerve in general, I suggest you to check the Peripheral Nerve Society website to join. In particular, if you are young, you have reduced rates. Among the different special interest groups, you also find a toxic neuropathy consortium. There, we discuss, we do research specifically on toxic neuropathy, not just CIPL, because of course, you might have other toxic neuropathies such as environmental uh, caused neuropathies. And I hope that uh, you enjoyed the presentation and you are not too much bored. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you so much, Professor, for the presentation and the very helpful and informative lecture you just gave us. Um, so guys, I'm gonna share screen right now and it's gonna show um, a feedback form that you can fill in. And uh, to get the <clears throat> attendance certificate, you need to fill in the feedback form that you can get by just taking a picture of this um, barcode. And uh, if it doesn't work, just let me know and I can send you a link. Um, I'm going to stop recording now. Okay.